Um, welcome to this presentation about uh, beta neutral to the left models of sparse networks. I'm Adam Foster, uh, statistics DPhil at Oxford, and this was joint work with uh, Ben Bloom Reddy, Emile Mathieu, and EY Tay. So um, I'll start with a broad overview. Uh, in modeling networks, we have these vertex and edge exchangeable models in gray and orange. And they're very powerful. They have tractable inference schemes. But there's some behaviors that they just don't capture. That's this uh, linear sparsity on the far right. On the other hand, we have preferential attachment models in blue. They can give us linear sparsity. But um, they're not really useful statistically. The inference is too difficult. In previous work, we proposed beta neutral to the left models. So they kind of give us all those three regimes, dense, sublinear sparsity, linear sparsity. Um, and the paper that I'm presenting, we showed how to make those models tractable. So we've now got these statistically useful models, um, and they give us things which those exchangeable models couldn't. So let's, let's kind of start from the beginning. We're talking about temporal networks. Those are the networks we're trying to model. And they're in discrete time where we add one edge at each time step. So here's a simple example of a social network where vertices represent people, edges maybe represent messages. So at the second time step, maybe Ben and I exchange a second message. At the third time step, we see a new vertex enter the network as somebody new begins communicating. And we can also think about ends of edges being assigned separately. So here we create one new vertex, and then we're going to assign that edge you know, in a se separate step. So drilling into those ends of edges a little more, this plot kind of shows those two ends of edges, both at vertex ID number one. That corresponds to a self-loop. Here we've added two more ends of edges, and we've introduced a new vertex, which we've labeled as number two. And so we progressively build up the edges, you know, and each has two ends of an edge. And one feature that people are really interested in here <coughs> is uh, the number of vertices against the number of edges. So those vertices only come in when they're sort of discovered, connected to. And we're interested in sort of the asymptotics. And we can sort of distinguish three cases in the asymptotics. So here we've still got number of edges, number of vertices. We're sort of zooming out now. Um, so if we start with that green curve at the bottom, that corresponds to a dense case um, where the number of vertices looks like the square root of the number of edges. And in a social network, if, the, if a social network were dense, I would say that a, me as a, a member of the network am communicating with some constant fraction of all the other people in the network. And broadly speaking, these aren't realistic for networks that we're trying to model. We're interested in these sparse networks where the number of vertices is growing more quickly as we add edges. And we can distinguish these two cases. So in this linear case, the rate at which we're adding new people is sort of constant. No matter how big our graph gets, we're adding people at a constant rate. By contrast, in the sublinear case, we still have sparsity, but we're adding people more and more slowly. And we're kind of interested in models that are going to capture you know, this whole range of behaviors. Um, why? Because we actually observe this in real data. So here's some data from Ask Ubuntu. The vertices are users. The edges are questions and answers. And we can see something that looks fairly convincingly like linear sparsity. The rate of people joining the network is pretty much constant. By contrast, here's a, a UCI social network. And we can see, you know, for sure, some sublinearity, people joining more slowly as the network grows. So I'm now going to switch track and talk about models and models that try and capture those sparsity classes. And so sort of a building block of understanding these models is exchangeability, hopefully a concept we're familiar with. But an exchangeable model is one where the sequence of random variables, maybe x, um, is invariant to permutation. So when we take a finite permutation, reorder some data points, that distribution should remain the same. Um, why is this an important building block for us? 
is because most tractable inference schemes that we find out there are based on exchangeability. When we're looking at large structures, some form of exchangeability is sort of the key that unlocks inference. So now I'm going to go back to this sort of model web and build it up a little more slowly. So vertex exchangeable models, which were sort of popular in the 70s and 80s, uh, were sort of conclusively proved by the Aldous Hoover theorem to only give dense graphs. And as I hopefully sort of motivated before, that's, that's not really a useful case. We, we want to look at sparse networks. On the other hand, we could sort of throw out exchangeability, so have no exchangeability at all, and a class of models which took this approach were preferential attachment models, like Ewell Simon. And instead, they took this ruling paradigm that the rich get richer. Vertices that are already connected highly by many edges are likely to be connected to again. And these do give sparse networks, but they're not, you know, they don't have tractable inference because we haven't got any exchangeability to exploit. And then more recently, people said, well, what if the edge process rather than the vertex process were the exchangeable part? And this turned out to be a very fruitful avenue. And things like the Pittman Yule process can be applied to modeling networks. But sort of the issue that I want to raise here is that we can we can't get that linear sparsity from exchangeability. That's you know that's inherent in those models that they won't give you a linear sparsity. That's why beta neutral to the left models are so interesting because within this one uh, model class we can sort of let the data decide: do we want dense, sublinear, or linear, rather than sort of siloing into a single class of models. And previously, so this is a non-exchangeable class of models. So previously that was sort of a big issue. And what this paper is really showing is that we can do inference here, despite the non-exchangeability. We'll be able to exploit some substructures and get something tractable. So I'm going to go now over the details of beta neutral to the left models, this non-exchangeable class, and then talk about you know, what the substructure is that unlocks inference. So we begin by generating a sequence of arrival times. So the arrival times, as you'll recall, are the first time when a vertex is seen in the network. So if you remember that original example, the EY vertex turned up, I think it was time step three. So EY's arrival time is three. And of course, by having sampled these up front, we now have full control over the sparsity properties, right? Sparsity is about how quickly new vertices enter the network. So based on what distribution we choose to sample here, we can have dense, sublinear, or linear sparsity. And then to sort of fill in the graph, fill in all the actual edges, um, we follow this uh, second step. So we've got the graph at time n, gn. And if we're due to see a new arrival, um, then we're duty bound to create a new vertex. That's what the arrival time means. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we're due to connect to an existing vertex, we're going to use a rule much like preferential attachment. So it's based on the degree of the node, but then uh, compensated by this parameter alpha. So this is, this is again a form of the rich get richer. We're more likely to connect to highly connected existing vertices. So these are beta neutral to the left models. And we're going to try and do inference on these and sort of unlock ways to model um, these, this linear sparsity regime. So, yeah, as I've just said, we want, we want tractable inference here. But the real blocker is exchangeable models we know that we can do inference there, but it's notoriously hard to do inference with non-exchangeable models. So the trick is generally to identify exchangeable substructures. Say, if you think about a hidden Markov model, it's not an exchangeable model, but if you take all the observations from a fixed latent state, then that would be an exchangeable substructure. And the exchangeable substructures here are sort of um, given on this diagram. So those dots are the ends of edges. So each pair would give you an edge. And we have time across the, the top axis with those arrival times, the first time of seeing a new vertex. Now, if you look at sort of this orange dashed line, um, ho hopefully that's visible, um, this says, look at all the points where we had to choose between either vertex one or vertex two after vertex two was sort of available, well, that's an exchangeable substructure. 
And it's these structures which are going to sort of be very powerful in forming uh, inference. And this is sort of inherently linked to the left neutrality, which you might have guessed is you know, important to beta neutral to the left processes. So based on that sort of insight about uh, exchangeable substructure, we can factorize the joint probability. And it sort of looks like, well, it's a product over vertices, which we might call that Gibbs structure. And it's a, pro a product of things which look like uh, binomial likelihoods. So these probabilities say, I'm going to choose vertex j, dj minus 1 times. So dj is its degree. And we're, we're taking off 1 because we had that fixed arrival time. We've conditioned on that. And t minus tj is just the number of possible time steps till the end. Um, so we have this product of things which look like binomial likelihoods. And that will then link with some uh, beta binomial conjugacy to give us some tractable inference. And in fact, um, when we come to look at inference and which variables it is we want to do inference for, um, these model variables are sort of, these are some latent variables which represent something like, how sociable is this vertex? Um, you know, some people in the network, you know, high sociability, many edges connect to them, other people um, less sociable, and we're going to model this with some latent variables. And based on that sort of, uh, binomial style likelihood, we'll actually be able to write down analytic Gibbs updates for these latent variables. So we, we're exploiting some beta binomial conjugacy. Now we also need to think about what data we actually have about our network. So if we know that we have observed arrival times already, then it's acceptable to just update these model variables. But if we didn't observe um, those arrival times, we can update those as part of the Gibbs sampler. And the way we'll do that is you know, by standard Gibbs approaches, condition on other arrival times, update them on a small interval. And with the arrival order, again, we may have observed it, we may not have observed it, and if we haven't observed it, we need to do Gibbs sampling over this space of permutations, um, which again is somewhat challenging, but that, that um, factorized form of the likelihood can help us out. Uh, what we find is that we initialize everything in this, in a particular order. So the intuition is if I have a high degree vertex, it's likely that that entered early and was able to build up all these edges connecting to it. So that's a good initialization. And then to actually sample, we'll just use some sort of swap proposal. So this sort of lays out a way to do a efficient Gibbs sampler for this BNTL class of models, which we're, you know, we're really concerned about because of this, um, this missing behavior that those edge exchangeable models can get us. So this is sort of, you know, maybe the centerpiece of what we've done. We've said, take some exchangeable substructure and look, we, we have a Gibbs sampler which runs in, in decent time. So in fact, we can uh, show uh, analytically, uh, empirically rather, that you know, we get some good results. So with our Gibbs sampler, we're interested in uh, recovering parameters. Um, we're interested in scalability with respect to a uh, number of edges. And for really massive graphs, we want to do some point estimates just to get an approximation. So here we, uh, we have some synthetic data. So the pitman yaw process in, in those first two lines, so we synthesize from the pitman yaw process, that's an edge exchangeable model. And then, unsurprisingly, when using that model to do inference, we recover, you know, we get better results if we, if we match that model class. So those first two lines are kind of things that we already could do. Edge exchangeable models, no problem. Then in the second two lines, we have these geometric inter-arrivals. So that's saying that new people enter the network at a constant rate, IID geometric random variables. So this brings us into a non-exchangeable beta neutral to the left territory. So that kind of, that very last line on the table where we've been able to do inference within that class of models, say, work out what the uh, geometric parameter was and this parameter alpha, that's kind of our new inference scheme coming into play. And unsurprisingly, by matching the, the model class that we used to synthesize, we got better results. 
then in terms of uh, scalability, what we find is the runtime is, is linear within the number of edges. I'm not going to put up <laughs> detailed results because you know, I think the message was very clear. And the reason for that is that we have this expensive Gibbs update for the arrival times, and that might be something we could work on you know, in terms of uh, improving the inference further. And finally, we took that Ask Ubuntu data set and a number of others, which I showed you earlier on, and we sort of fitted point estimates for a number of models. Um, so here we have uh, the Pittman Yule process, well, two sort of variants of it, which I could go into details later. Um, but really what we found was that those Pittman Yule processes are not well specified for this data. And that does make sense if you remember that had sort of a, this strong linear sparsity, and these models just aren't able to capture linear sparsity. Whereas when we suggested some non-exchangeable beta neutral to the left based on a geometric distribution for the arrival times, well, then we found that we got better results. So to sum up, uh, we have these beta neutral to the left models which are very flexible in the kinds of things that they can represent. Dense networks, sublinear sparse networks, linear sparse networks. But they're not exchangeable, so the inference was difficult. And our work said, actually, we can exploit exchangeable substructure and get, you know, give samplers which run, you know, in comparable time to the exchangeable models. So thank you very much for listening. I'd like to thank my co-authors, Ben, Emil, and EY. And now, hopefully, I have a little time for some questions. <laughs>